What did Paul mean when he said man is the head of woman? So they've looked closely at the Bible in the original languages, they've turned to ancient writings, and to the writings of the early church for clues. What did they find? First, they note, the Bible never uses the expression head of the household. It always uses master of the household and seems to make no distinction between a man or a woman master of the household. Second, Dr. Philip B. Payne, author of Man and Woman, One in Christ, points out, The idea of authority was not normally associated with the word for head in Greek thought. Third, they note, ancient peoples believed the intellect was in the heart, not in the head. Jesus refers to the heart as the source of evil intentions when he says, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes from the heart, for out of the heart come evil intentions. Dr. Payne quotes the philosopher-poet Lucretius's view of the heart. The rational power, which we call the mind and the intellect, has its fixed place in the central area of the breast, because this is where fear and dread surge up. This is the vicinity in which the joys caress us. Here, therefore, is the mind and the intellect. So, if the Greeks believed the intellect was in the heart, not in the head, what did they believe about the head? Many theologians and scholars argue that the Greeks used the word head to mean source or origin, like the head of a river is its source. And, they argue, the Greeks believed that the head was the source of life. Ancient peoples noticed that in nature many seeds are formed at the top or head of a plant, and many seeds are encased in a protective shell. Both Plato and Aristotle reasoned that sperm must be formed in the head and the skull was its protective shell. Dr. Catherine Clark Crager summarizes Plato's view. The gods created a receptacle for the soul, which was itself the seed, and encased it within the strong bones of the skull. The route through which the sperm should pass was well guarded by the spinal column. The Greeks noticed, too, that seeds develop roots, so plants can draw in the nourishment they need to grow and thrive. In the same way, they believed the veins started in the head and were like roots, feeding and nourishing the whole body. This has led many theologians and scholars to conclude that our English understanding of the expression head of has confused the New Testament's intended meaning. They believe Paul uses head of to mean source of life and sustenance, not boss or authority. But what about the passage in the Bible that says, the head of man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God? Isn't that clearly teaching a hierarchy of man over woman? These scholars point out that God is listed dead last here. If it was establishing a hierarchy of man over woman, it would put God first, not last. They believe this passage is about origins, not hierarchy. That head in this passage fits perfectly with the meaning of source of life and sustenance. Dr. Gilbert Bilizekian, author of Beyond Sex Roles, was a founding leader of the Willow Creek Community Church and a faculty member at Wheaton College. He takes this view. Indeed, we find that the word head has the value of provider, servant, giver, beginning, source. And for that I go to the New Testament and to the five instances where the word head is used in relation to Christ being the head of the church. 
And in each one of those five cases, the function of the head is a provider-servant function. It is never given the meaning of Christ being Lord over the church. Certainly, he's Lord of everything and he's Lord of the church. But when that terminology of head is used, it is used precisely to convey a different meaning. For instance, Ephesians chapter 1, where we are told that the Father has put all things under Christ's feet, and above all things, he has made him head for the church. Not over the church, but for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The function of the head toward the body he is, is to give fullness, to give growth. It's a servant function. It's not an oversight function. The word head appears again in relation to Christ and the body, the church. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 15 and 16, where the head provides the body with cohesion and with growth. Again, in this passage, the function of the head to the body is one of equipping, of nurturing, of growing. The same thing is true for the text in chapter 5, verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Christ's headship to the church is defined here as saviorhood, not as lordship, as saviorhood, which is a servant role, which refers to the cross. In Colossians, we have two references to the uh, headship of Christ. In um, a passage where the apostle Paul deals with the supremacy of Christ over everything, he goes to the church, he's uh, to, to Christ in relation to the church. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. His relation as her head to the church, Christ's relation as head to the church, is to be the source of the life of the church, to be the beginning the firstborn from the dead, a reference to the resurrection of which he sets the pattern for all believers. And then a Col in Colossians chapter 2, verse 19, where the, we are enjoined to hold, hold fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. So again here, the reference is to the function of Christ in regard to the church that gives it growth. It is a servant function. It's not a top-down authority function. Quite the opposite. So, to conclude, we must always remember that Paul's writings were first and foremost letters, and each one of those letters is part of a story, Paul's story, as he struggled to bring the gospel to Ephesus. When we read his letters to Timothy and to the Ephesians, we are eavesdropping, eavesdropping on a one-way conversation to a foreign culture a culture where goddess worship was the backbone of the economy, a culture where women ran the pagan temple and emulated Amazon woman warriors, and a place where Gnostic heresies were taking root, heresies that denied the humanity of Jesus, heresies that turned Eve into a celestial being who gave life and wisdom to Adam. So, after examining the culture, 
After looking closely at the Bible in the original languages, and after noting Paul's references to women in positions of authority, many scholars are concluding the Apostle Paul was not establishing a hierarchy of men over women, or of husbands over wives. They believe he was refuting heresies and protecting the Ephesian community from pagan ideas and rituals. So when we read the Bible, we must always ask, what did this mean to its original audience? And to answer that, we must look at the culture to whom it was written. If we don't, we will wrench it out of its historical context, miss the intended meaning, and reduce the Bible to a collection of verses and a book of rules.